What is up, YouTube? What is up, family? We have a Patreon request, and it looks like I'm about to get schooled yet again. We got uh, Tutoberg. Tutoberg? I, I don't know. 9 AD. The Roman uh, Germanic Wars documentary. So in uh, Dutch world, I believe, Rumstein video, uh, I don't know. I was under the impression the Romans were actually doing really good and winning, but just all of a sudden decided, you know, that's it. We're, I don't know. It's some weird thing that I read somewhere. I know I read it because I didn't make it up. What the hell do I know about the Romans? But um, I don't know. I read somewhere that the Romans were, you know, definitely doing well in this war. They were about to even possibly win if they put a little effort into it or, you know, I may, you know I'm using my words incorrectly, but all of a sudden they just turned around and left, turned around and said, no, we're not, we're, we're good, we're finished, we're done. It's weird, I know, but I swear I read that. Not that they won, but not that they lost, that even the Germans were like confused, I thought, like, what, what, what the hell just happened? They're fighting, they're fighting, they're fighting, and they left. Yay, we won, but did we? Or did they just turn around and leave? Like, I don't know. Anyway, this, I'm sure, is going to clear it up for me. So, let's go. Let's check it out. Patreon request. Hopefully, I don't need a... This video was sponsored by The Great Courses Plus. Go to thegreatcoursesplus.com today to start your free trial. By the beginning of the 1st century AD, the Roman Republic had been replaced by the Roman Principate under Augustus, who ended the period of civil wars and brought back stability. However, the Romans still faced many dangers. To the north, the Germanic tribes were gradually forming larger unions, and they would fight the Roman Empire throughout the next few centuries. The Battle of Teutoburg Forest would become one of the most iconic in the conflict between the Germanic tribes and Rome. Mm. The chaotic period of the late Roman Republic finally concluded after Octavian's victory at the Battle of Actium in 31 BC. The Republican system was irredeemably broken, and Octavian had no intention of giving up the power he had won. In the following years, he expelled political opponents from the Senate and solidified his hold on the collapsing Republican institutions. On January 16, 27 BC, the Senate declared him Augustus, the illustrious one, and granted him ultimate power, effectively making him the very first Roman Emperor, though technically the Republican facade was maintained. The Mediterranean world entered a period of relative peace, prosperity and stability, known as the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. Augustus further expanded the empire's dominion, annexing northern Spain and Pannonia, in addition to parts of Asia Minor and Judea. Augustus secured his eastern border by making peace with the Parthians, disappointing many Romans who wanted revenge for their defeat at Carre. Although the Pax Romana guaranteed peace for the majority of the Ascendant Empire, there were a few exceptions. There In the are. aftermath of Gaius Julius Caesar's conquest of Gaul, Rome had gained new natural borders along the Rhine and Danube. The unknown wilderness beyond this protective boundary was frightening to the Romans, and was home to the fearsome Germanic tribes. In the process of fully Romanizing the formerly Gallic lands, Augustus's most trusted friend Agrippa began to expand a network of roads from Lugdunum to the north, attempting to reach both the English Channel and the River Rhine. The vast area beyond the Rhine was beginning to attract the attention of the Roman elites. This was shown not only by the road building in the region, but also the resettlement of the allied Ubian tribe to act as a buffer between Rome and more hostile Germanic tribes in 19 BC. When the legionary forces of Gallic legate Marcus Lollius were defeated by said tribes in 16 BC, the will of Augustus to conquer the region was said to have strengthened even further. Later that year, he incorporated the region of Noricum into the province of Pannonia, and a year later, 
his stepsons Tiberius and Drusus the Elder conquered what would become the province of Raetia. Wow, they were, they were seriously gaining ground here. Oh my god, they were, you could tell, they're just slowly sucking up the, the land. Kind of almost like engulfing Germania. Interesting. Roman incursions into its northern frontier were growing more intense. A few years later, Agrippa and Tiberius attacked the various tribes in Illyricum. Agrippa commanded this offensive at first, but he unexpectedly perished in the spring of 12 BC, leaving Tiberius in command. Hmm. Under his direction, the tribes in this region were subdued piecemeal. At the same time, Drusus was also succeeding in Germania, quickly achieving territorial gains and wintering in the region for several years, eventually reaching all the way to the river Elba in 9 BC. However, Drusus fell from his horse and died on his way back from Germania in that year. What? All the battles, all the war, and you died by falling off your horse? Well, damn. That's some bad luck. Seriously? Drusus fell from his horse and died on his way back from Germania in that year. Oh, Tiberius wow. then took command in Germania, treated his foes savagely, and almost succeeded in making it a tribute-paying province. As of 7 BC, it is said that Augustus considered it just that, asserting that all the Germanics living between the Rhine and Elba had submitted. The reality was very different. The Cherusci tribe were one of those pacified by Drusus in these campaigns, and hostages from its most prominent families were taken to Rome. One of these figures was the son of a Cherusci chieftain, Arminius. As a ho uh, we know about Arminius. hostage, he served in the Roman military, learned Latin, was awarded Roman citizenship for his contribution, and uh. was made an equestrian. To support the legionary heavy infantry, Rome's leaders recruited provincial soldiers and even men from unconquered territories such as Germania. They served in the auxiliary units of light infantry and were usually commanded by their tribal leaders. For now, Augustus had other problems. In 6 BC, personal matters convinced Tiberius to retire from politics and sail to Rhodes, where he stayed for years. This abrupt withdrawal angered Augustus due to the destabilizing effect it would have on his succession. While Tiberius quickly regretted his decision and pleaded to be allowed to return, the angered princeps refused repeatedly. During this period, Rome gradually expanded its influence even further into Germania. In 3 BC, Lucius Domitius Ahenobarbus reached the Elba with his own army and assisted in the construction of infrastructure to the east of the Rhine. Meanwhile in Rome, Lucius and Gaius Caesar, grandsons of the emperor, were being groomed for the imperial office. However, in 2 AD, Lucius perished, and two years later, Gaius died in Armenia, leaving Augustus with no other choice than to recall Tiberius. He was adopted by the princeps, and in turn was made to adopt the 21-year-old Germanicus as his own son. Soon after, Tiberius was sent to Germania and immediately subjugated another series of tribal groups, including the Cherusci. Part of the Roman strategy in this period was to resettle troublesome tribal peoples and move them to locations where Rome could keep a very close eye on them. Around this time, Arminius returned to his people in the north. Power struggles within the Cherusci clan led one faction, led by the clan of Arminius, to become allies of the Roman invaders. They were supported by Tiberius, who constructed a winter fort near their territory on the Lippa River. Later in Tiberius's command, a huge pincer movement was planned to fully conquer the region between the rivers Rhine and Elba. However, the Great Illyrian Revolt broke out in 6 AD and required a massive military response, so Tiberius marched south to deal with it. As he was now busy with other matters, Augustus appointed Publius Quinctilius Varus as the commander in Germania. 
This general and politician had proved himself to be a competent administrator, both in Africa and the troublesome province of Syria, where he had to deal with the Parthians and quell the rebellions in the region. Modern historians conclude that while Varus was a very good administrator, he was not a soldier. In 7 AD, he was appointed the legate, the governor of Germania, replacing Tiberius, who also took eight of the eleven legions with him. So much going on here, it's like just so much information. The Cherusci prince Arminius accompanied Varus and had become a seemingly loyal advisor. The early part of the year 9 AD was successful for the empire in Germania. Oh, 9 AD, I mean, those were the good old days. Remember 9 AD? When... Never mind. For the first time, Varus's legions were able to move freely and relatively unhindered through the province, carrying out their duties such as patrolling and road building. The legate himself performed many administrative duties to provincialize the new region, such as tax collection and adjudication of tribal disputes in the Roman legal system. However, all was not to continue going smoothly as summer progressed. Varus began to receive reports that many small detachments of troops patrolling and constructing infrastructure in the supposedly friendly territory were being massacred by tribes such as the Angravarii and Bructeri. It's a lot of men. War. This series of betrayals seemed to be spontaneous, but was in reality orchestrated by none other than the Germanic prince Arminius. I knew it. At yeah. some point he had decided to turn against his Roman allies, mm. possibly due to the cruelty against people like his that he had witnessed during his service, or simply because he wished to rule his tribe without Roman taxation. Throughout the summer, Arminius had used the autonomy of his dual role of Roman officer and Germanic chieftain to consolidate local tribal support and to seek allies in the tribes who were always troublesome for the empire. However, the chieftain's plan was almost foiled by his angered father-in-law, Segestes, who betrayed the plan to ambush the legionary column to Varus. Despite this, the Roman foolishly trusted his ally commander and had Segestes taken away. With this done, the army began to march from their summer camp to winter quarters west of the Rhine. However, as he set off, Varus was beseeched by some locals to quell a revolt that had broken out to the west, and he adjusted his direction accordingly. Just then, the seemingly loyal Arminius rode up to his beloved commander, professing that he must ride away in order to assemble the auxiliary forces. This would not have seemed odd, because the auxilia were scattered at the time and would take a while to come together again. Though he had moved away, Arminius left a few select men with the column for use as spies. The so-called revolt was a decoy, organized by the traitorous Taruscan prince, who now moved to organize his forces, numbering anywhere from 20 to 30,000. However, his plan was to attack the Romans rather than to aid them. On the morning of September 7th, Varus addressed his army, which had around 30,000 troops, and informed them of the change of plans, promising loot and spoils before marching away. They marched the necessary 16 miles on that day before encamping for the night in the unfamiliar territory that Arminius's local guides were now luring him into. At 7am on the 8th, the Romans formed into their marching column prepared for battle, but were taken into an area of heavy forest which both slowed the march considerably and dangerously strung out the column, isolating many of its contingents. Meanwhile, in the forests, the Germans were watching, and the legionaries were completely unaware. In the late morning, the Romans were met by a shower of stones, arrows, and Frumia spears coming from all directions as the Bructeri tribe launched spoiling attacks against them. At this point, the aim was not to destroy the Romans, but to weigh them down with material losses and more wounded. After causing some losses, the Germans faded away into the forests, accompanied by the guides Arminius had left with Varus. The legions were now blind and lost as a continuous heavy downpour began. 
Finally breaking through into open country, the legate now ordered a camp to be erected, where he held a war council. It was decided that the army would continue westward on the forest path, as without their guides, it was the only option. In addition, they would take the callous step of leaving their wounded and baggage train behind to increase speed. Breaking camp in the morning, the legions found that the rain had caused their forest route to become a sea of mud, with fallen trees and other obstacles slowing them on the way. As they thrust deeper into the dense forest, the tribal Germanic warriors struck the Romans again, skirmishing viciously with them. The legionaries attempted to form up to defend themselves, but they were in unfavourable terrain. By afternoon, they had suffered grievous losses, and the orderly marching column had degenerated into three distinct contingents, strung out over miles of trail with Varus in the rear. The command structure of this column had effectively broken down. Fortunately for them, the Romans again broke into an area of open country by evening and made another marching camp, where Varus held another war council. He now knew that they were in a deadly situation and had to take drastic measures. Valor, a cavalry commander, was ordered to take the Roman horse via a path to the north in order to contact Roman allies and forces to the west. However, as this force rode north, they were attacked and destroyed by more Germans armed with pilfered Roman equipment. When news of this final defeat reached Varus, he and many of his senior officers committed suicide. Two officers now took command of the bruised and battered force, Lucius Egius and Caonius. On the morning of the 11th, Egius marched further west, where everything was quiet at first. Then he encountered an earthen rampart to his left, which he knew to be a trap. His column stopped and he dispatched the remnants of two cohorts to clear the barricade. Meanwhile behind him, Caonius's force had set off to reinforce them, but was attacked by the main mixed infantry and cavalry German horde led by Arminius himself. After a great slaughter and the beheading of Varus's corpse, Arminius then pushed west and violently slaughtered the remainder of Aegeus. Beheading, we saw that in, uh, in, in Dutch, uh, Dutchland. Wow, a lot, wow. There was a lot of this in Dutchland, but without understanding this, it was... You know, you just don't get it. Arminius was uh, definitely the man. I can see why you guys got a statue of him now. Yeah, so, okay, so everything I read was basically the absolute opposite of what really happened. <laughs> That's great, because the Romans uh, looks to me like, uh, yeah, they got wrecked is what happened. They got fooled. They got strategically played. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, Germania. Certainly won, that's for sure, from what I'm seeing. And uh, and, and won big. This is column, which had been slowed down by the barricade, as intended. As intended, yeah. They got them good, man. Wow. The defeat was total and catastrophic for the Romans. Almost the entire force was either butchered or enslaved. Many officers were sacrificed to the ancient Germanic gods in ritual ceremonies, whereas other soldiers were crucified against trees or cooked in pots. Jesus. The sight would have been a truly horrific scene. Yeah, I mean, you know, it really, it, it, when you hear things like that, we are truly monsters, us humans, to think of the shit we did and the things we still do today. We are true monsters, really. I mean, come on, you need to cook somebody in a pot to make a point? Really? Ooh, that's crazy. That is crazy. With all the beheadings back then. Uh, mm. Wow, this is, some, this is good stuff. This is good stuff. See, I was under the impression when I saw Germania in red that that's it. They were captured, it was over, they were part of Rome now. No, not even close. In Rome, Emperor Augustus was said to have been so shaken by the defeat that he would bash his head against the wall, infamously shouting, Quintilius Varus, give me back my legions! However, the Romans would not take this defeat lying down, and new battles in Germania would soon come. Uh, when we uh, 
create our videos so they didn't just lay down. as a source we often use the series of lectures called the Decisive Battles of World History from Professor Gregory Aldretti, provided by the sponsor of this video, The Great Courses Plus. Wow, I guess you could get all your history right from this, uh, right from this channel. Interesting. Ah, so there was more. See, I thought that was it. That's it. Romans got destroyed, laid their weapons down, and that's it. Germania won, and... Everything else just move forward. And nope, apparently not. I guess there's a part two to this somewhere on uh, on the Romans trying to trying to recover and, and and retake Germany. I don't know. Oof. But okay, I get it now. I get it. Yeah, everything I said about Dutch land was basically wrong. <laughs> Thus why the Patreon said, uh yeah, you need to you need to you need to check that out. Yeah. Well I could definitely see why he's a hero now. I could definitely see why you guys got a Big ass statue of him, because yeah, uh, he was just a tad bit important in uh, Germania's uh, history, Germany, if you will, Germany's history. Uh, all right, good stuff, good stuff, good information, and you know, I'm learning every day with you guys. Every day I learn a little more by you, all because of you guys. All right, so yeah, I'm sure most uh, most Germans know all about this already, and most people that are not German. There's a very good chance you learned something here, too. And that's the point. All right. On to the next one. Take care. Peace out. Have a good night.